Thank you. You want to ask to make sure that they can hear you, like any audio chat? Yes. Yeah. Before I take Do those people on Zoom in to hear us. Oh, I got a thumbs up. Okay. And you weren't even looking and you were talking all real quiet. So she did. Yes. Yeah, so thank you. Thanks everybody for being here. I'm really glad to see some uh, familiar faces as well as senior faces. Um, so we have a special guest speaker here from the Association of Environmental Professionals here to give a, a presentation on California's Environmental Quality Act, which is pretty much the prevailing uh, environmental legislation for the state. So I'll hand it over to you. Good evening. My name is Kyle Simpson. I'm a principal with LSA Associates. We're an environmental consulting firm. We have offices throughout the state. Um, I'm in the Clovis office, and I deal mostly with projects um, of various types throughout the city of Valley. Uh, so I'm going to go over just a few things. Uh, let's see if this, this works. Okay. Um, this is a very general uh, description of scene. I can get bogged down in details for hours and hours. So I'm going to just kind of go over a few things. And um, I probably will skip through some slides pretty quickly because I don't, don't think everyone wants to know all the detailed uh, information that rattles around in my brain too much. Um, I, but I think that it's helpful to kind of understand the complexity of CEQA and understand what it means for not only projects, but just for the state of the environment in California, but not only from the political and uh, I guess environmental side, but also the environment of just how uh, different developments and cities operate and counties operate and how the state operates. So we'll go over the basics, um, kind of the first steps, what happens when you go through CEQA, you start out the process. Um, and I have a, a typo and that's supposed to be an initial study checklist. Um, so it's in the there, but um, that's, we'll get into the kind of what CEQA looks at um, in terms of all of the different resource topic areas, and then what are the uh, environmental documents that come out of uh, the CEQA, uh, the CEQA process. There are many. So um, CEQA really is an opportunity, and the only thing you're going to take away from CEQA is that it's really a public disclosure process. What we're doing is taking as much information as possible and providing that to decision makers, so when they actually have to make a decision on whether or not to uh, approve a project or not, they have all the information in front of them. Good one and bad. Um, CEQA is supposed to be objective, not subjective. So we are supposed to provide data and provide information to provide that data so anyone can understand. So it's taking all the technical aspects of um, the environment in terms of engineering data, uh, hydrology, hydrology uh, geology, soil, all sorts of things that go into the CEQA, 20 different research topics area, and distilling that down information that uh, decision makers can uh, use. A lot of that comes out of engineering, right? So a lot of the projects that we have to deal with have very specific uh, requirements that they have to meet that we have to transfer. So CEQA in itself is full of acronyms, uh, like anything that the state does, there's uh, abbreviations for it. Um, so we, if I say any of these types of things, and like I said, there are a few, um, if I say any of these types of uh, acronyms, let me know and I will explain what that is. But every one of these things I know very well um, because I have to deal with them every day in different parts of different projects. Uh, maybe you have heard of an EIR before. An EIR, you'll hear more about them in the news in the last maybe five years or so. Those are like the environmental documents. They're always referred to the news as the environmental document or the impact report, things like that. And that's the big, huge thousands of pages of uh, documentation that's done for a project to identify whether or not it has any impacts. That's what I do. I do that and manage the preparation of that. Uh, I coordinate with different technical folks in our uh, company to uh, prepare that all together for, uh, for different lead agencies. Those lead agencies are responsible for implementing C1. So, um, this all started back in the late 60s when there was a push for environmental um, 
information to be out there. There's more accessible protection of the environment. And it's a big change between the early part of the 19th or 20th century into the 60s, where we're more conscious of the environment. Um, at that time, it really started off with something uh, at the national level where there's a, uh, a focus on um, potential impacts that might uh, address or might affect the environment. In California, because California is a little more progressive in a lot of things, um, this started off as a small project. Actually, it, there was a, um, was a, the one in 1972 was the, the, the biggest and the sea change, I guess you could say, in uh, SeaWorld, where there was a project up in Mammoth that had a cultural resources component. And because of that cultural resources component, more and more things got added into the environmental process. Um, originally, it was intended to have um, did the governments actually prepare uh, CEQA documents, provide this information in their staff reports off to the decision making body? So, a city council, a board of supervisors, um, some other type of board or agency. And they're supposed to provide that information and give it to them. And over time, that became more difficult because more and more information is, and we become more, uh, I guess, uh, more technical information became available. And when you have staffs at you know, the city of Fresno, for example, who aren't geologists, who aren't biologists, they don't want to keep those people on staff. So they have consultants. And that's where, over time, the consultant field where I'm in became more and more uh, prevalent for preparing these documents. So the intent really is for us to go through or for uh, preparers of a CEQA document to identify potential environmental impacts. And then mitigate those as the best way possible, um, and, and mitigate that to the fullest extent possible, and then provide that information uh, and reduce that reduce the impacts as much as possible. But then provide that information to decision makers. Um, when we, when you do when you do that, decision makers can then take into consideration all the bad things that might happen as a result of the project and still approve the project. It doesn't mean that it's going to kill the project. It means the decision makers have the ability to understand what the project. Is. So um, a good example of this, uh, I don't know if anybody follows baseball. Tell us a big baseball crowd. Um, the Oakland A's um, tried to have several different um, new uh, stadiums in the Bay Area. They tried many of these. Um, they did the EIRs for at least, I think there was two sites. They might have done a third EIR uh, to, to, to determine whether or not the construction and operation of that facility would result in uh, the last one they did, they went through a huge process. It was near a bowl of um, uh, shipping uh, area that's in Oakland, and they found a bunch of impacts that are all significant, all these bad things. But it turned out that the city was probably going to be okay with those impacts. They're they're fine with it as long as they mitigate them as much as possible, which means reducing those impacts. Um, but in the end, it just didn't happen. So, and but they were all signs were pointing to it being approved. I mentioned that because. 10 years ago, you didn't hear about the EIR. You didn't hear about the uh, big documents that people were coming out with. And honestly, in the state of California, this, this the disclosure process is what typically does in projects. And I, don't, I don't mean that badly, but that's typically where the opposition will fund the project and attempt to either uh, oppose it and make sure it doesn't happen, or you know, come out and speak in its favor. CEQA is kind of the area where you can challenge it. So the thing is that it's not as easy to challenge, um, but CEQA allows different people to come out and provide comments on, during that disclosure process. I'm not going to go into the, the laws um, too much. There, it, it continually changes the availability, the applicability of uh, different uh, laws related to CEQA changes. Uh, do different case law every year. So every year we get updates and we understand that they may be looking at things a little bit differently this year. Um, the, the resource topic areas, the 20 areas I talked about, um, those change those changed over the years. It used to be, I think, like 15 or so when I started. Now there's 20. So it, it kind of goes up. And there's probably going to be more. Uh, it's not going to get any smaller because more issues for now. Uh, so getting back to what I was mentioning before, that you know, who prepares documents? A lead agency is a, a body that has the uh, opportunity to approve or um, deny a project. A lead agency is usually a city or a county, a state agency, somebody that actually has a board of supervisors or some other agency that, or some other uh, decision making body that has a discretionary involved with the project. 
So they get to say yes or no. Um, so that can be a flood control district. That can be a uh, in type of uh, fire prevention protection district. It can be any types of um, airport districts. I mean, in the airport um, land use commission. Right? So they have, and, and it kind of scales up in a different county. It can get kind of, um, but the the documents themselves, like I said, are supposed to be prepared by them. As a, as a consultant, they instead of having those people on staff, they hire a consultant so they can just you know, pay the money to be done with it um, or get through the process. Um, but we're supposed to use objective, independent judgment. Um, so we don't decide on anything. We just provide all the information to those, to those agencies. So again, yeah, four minutes decision makers, um, they, different documents require different uh, public review periods. Um, I can talk a little bit about that a little bit later. Um, and they all include different technical reports that we uh, include and kind of distill that information. The biggest part of this, and this is kind of, uh, I guess you can say, is why it came out of like the 60s and 70s when we were environmental uh, consciousness, is that this is a big, like I said, it's a public disclosure process. So the intent really is to have the public involved in documentation, at least have been able to comment on it. When you get into large EIRs, for like the open days, you have a uh, review period where people get to comment. Anyone, you guys, can anyone in here can go and comment on it? Say actually, I think the, the analysis is wrong because of this reason or this reason, or so you should do this analysis instead, or something like that. And that that way, it opens up the the decision makers, we can say, for example, city council, for to say, oh yeah, that's a good point. Maybe we provide response to this. That doesn't really work out. See, so you say, oh okay, I understand. So there's a couple different ways that it goes about, and, that, and then I'm probably confusing things a little bit for you. We deal with this every day. So, if there's any questions, so <clears throat> a project is something that for me is almost kind of hard to define. Um, but when you look at it under CEQA, um, we're not talking about like, oh, I want to add a deck to my, it's not what a project That's a ministerial decision. Um, that's something that you provide the engineering drawings or the plans to the to plan check for that city, they can't say no. If they do say no, you can see that kind of thing. When you have a discretionary action, it's, it's up to someone's to set decision making process. That's something where you get into projects like if you want to build addition to this campus here. You can't just go out and do it, you have to have someone's approval to do that. The approval usually comes the same. Uh, school is a good example because it's also a state agency. Um, say if you want to go build a, a gas station nearby here. You'd have to go and get it from the city of um, That's something that it doesn't, they don't have to say this. So it's not a ministerial decision, it's discretionary. And the discretion is the same. Um, so in those first steps, it's like, well, are you building a deck? Okay, yeah, no secret. Okay, you build a, a gas station? Okay, let's look at secret. Now, is this a exempt project? That's the first line of defense, I guess, for some developers. Well, no, no, my project is exempt from secret. There are classifications for that. There's categorical and statutory exemptions. Those are all getting kind of technical, but they still need some documentation to say that no, there's not really an exemption, or there's not really an impact. This is this is covered. We don't have to do it. We are exempt from doing so. And then if that's the case, we basically do a notice that saying uh, we are exempt from this project is exempt. Um, and you know, for gas stations, it probably doesn't work out quite like that because there's probably some other things you have to do too. Uh, to have a, a, a group. So <clears throat> this we might come back to this later on, but this is kind of the, the process of what would uh, typically happen for a document that is not uh, exempt from SQL. After you propose the action, you go to lead agency and say, I want to do this. They decide if it's a project or not. Um, if the project is, then you find out. Uh, and if it's not exempt from SQL, you go through what's called Typically, we go through an initial study process, which is, as the name implies, the initial study. That's the first study. Um, and here's a really helpful diagram that goes through the steps. Um, I won't go through all of these, but this provides a pretty good understanding of where you have the, in part one, you have the first initial steps of how to actually start your project. The initial study, as we'll talk about a little bit, has all the different. Um, the initial study can be done um, 
Yeah, if your project is not exempt, you can do an initial study for reasons. So it's to find that the project does not have to be mitigated with them, and you still have to have a discretionary action. They still have to decide on them. But it might be that you do have mitigation measures. We can use that initial study to say, yes, there's impacts. We identified them, we mitigated them, fine. But uh, if you can't mitigate them to a level that is less than significant, it's the specific term, uh, you will go into an EIR. Terry, that's kind of the latter part of this. But for the prepared negative declaration, prepared mitigated negative declaration, those are both on one track. You see how they're up higher there. They are less intense. It's usually a pretty big document, but it's not as intense as an EIR. EIR is a separate track, and it has more steps to it, and is more public to do than the required. Uh, and when I say required, you have to do early consultation for 30 days, or do 30 days, and you do a bunch of analysis, and then you do 45 days. And during all that time, the public sending comments and provided input on the presentation. It's all part of the public record. And then that goes off eventually to the agency. So, it's, it, it goes on for, there's lots of different avenues and frames for CEQA in terms of how you apply CEQA to different projects. I don't, I feel like I'm going to get too into the, the weeds with some of this stuff. And it's probably best to. Talk about kind of the types of projects and then what are the things that typically come to So, like I mentioned before, you could have a gas station, you can have any sort of you know, development projects of any kind. Any place that have been in the city of Fresno, there's probably, this is supposed to have been an EIR or an initial study or some environmental documentation, something has to be done. For it. If it's built in the last 50 years, it's in some sort of environmental documentation. Whether or not it was something simple way back in the 80s or 90s. There's been some sort of environmental documentation to identify whether or not this would have a substantial or adverse effect. These exemptions, there's lots of different abilities to use these exemptions. There's classes, there's classes or categories of exemptions. There's like 30 different things, little exemptions, small additions to your buildings that do have some impacts but aren't substantial. We can get into that. Those are some things that. Are just kind of the, the, the law side of it. They don't really go to the application of the environmental applications. Uh, I always find this interesting the 1984 Olympics were statutory. So anything that's associated with the structure integration for the Olympics in Los Angeles, don't worry, it doesn't matter. Which I thought was interesting because it's just a lot of stuff that happens with the Olympics. Uh, pipelines, I don't, I've done a lot of statutory exemptions for pipelines because I don't. Different classifications and categorical exemptions and lots of different kinds that can be used. Uh, and all of these do can be benefited. Uh, but we get into initial studies, um, and there's lots of different uh, resource topics uh, that we look at. So, um, so for initial study, basically, it's a small EIO. It goes through 20 different research topic areas. We identify what the project is, we have a detailed explanation of what the project is. So it's interesting to read the description that we have for CEQA, understand what the project is, understand what the area is, all the things that go into it. Um, there's actual determination that's made for it. Um, and then you go into the environmental checklist. Um, each of these topic areas, these are all things that are coming under CEQA. Uh, each one of these has several different questions that we look at. To keep applying what's called the Appendix G uh, checklist. That, that checklist has questions that, are, that came out of the law, uh, the statutory uh, the statute itself, and then the guidelines themselves. And this these provide questions that are the standards of significance. Each one of those probably has somewhat of a, a threshold that is applicable to uh, the, those conditions. What I mean by that is like an air district. As thresholds for what becomes a toxic air contaminant. We have to look at that under air quality. We can talk about does this uh, have any, uh, will this be consistent with any air quality plan? If it, that, that question in itself, we have to go through and provide detailed information about what the project's future is. Like. So that becomes in itself a very long task of providing modeling data and identifying whether or not there is any potential. We get into some things um, cultural resources wise, there's there are databases. 
Um, we have um, basically a web record search to identify any things that are recorded in the area. Uh, and then from there, you can, you know, in most cases, go out into a site survey. We have a cultural resources specialist, as well as being in a, a built environment historian, go out and really go to the site and identify new materials for pets, 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 sites. Some of these are kind of more uh, data based or data associated. So, like air quality, greenhouse gases, energy, uh, noise, and transportation, those are all areas that are linked. Because they are all kind of related to traffic that's being generated. Traffic and transportation, uh, which is further down on the list here, um, that's a huge issue because most people familiar with how cars work and know that if you build a building, there's going to be more cars going to it. So, based on that alone, people generally have comments and concerns about traffic. Over the years, the way you look at traffic has changed in the state. Um, up until recently, we looked at whether or not a proposed building was going to add X number of vehicles to an intersection and what that's going to happen to that intersection. Um, there was a really big change that happened a couple of years ago that we don't do that. Now we look at what's called vehicle miles traveled. And that's really an attempt to address greenhouse gases by saying, well, if you have a development of any kind, the vehicles from that development may go to and from them. The average mile for them to go associated with that project to work or to home, or sorry, to work or to grocery store or whatever, the average miles that they're gonna have to go, the, the shorter that is, the less impact it's gonna have. And you have all these miles to go. The idea was is that if you have to drive, if you build the development way out far out in the county by itself, you're gonna to have to drive 20 miles to get into town. That's gonna to be more greenhouse gases. This could be more pollutants in the air and get into Adversely affected. And when you do that, you're going to have more impacts. So now the transportation is going away from the actual premises, you know, the issues related to an intersection, now looking at kind of an environment as to how the emissions are going to be uh, calculated and how the emissions are going to affect the state. So if there's, there's different ways to look at it. And we I can talk about each one of these things and how it all affects things. Um, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be easy to get into that. But, um, new topic areas like wildfire were recently added based on the state's wildfire issues. And again, probably from the um, how climate change has affected the environment. Um, new uh, tribal cultural resources are another good example. That's something that was, was relatively new because it's been, as you say, codified into what we're looking at. Um, cultural, tribal cultural resources now even more of a boost to tribes to be actively involved in development projects where they have traditionally been involved. Is most of them. Or do they learn is that they are named? Uh, um, so it's a good opportunity for more comments from people that set more disclosure information. And then we get into other topic areas uh, land use plan and consistency regarding that. Uh, we do look at public services. Uh, not so much is this going to mean you have to hire more police officers, but that's not really an environmental impact. It's do you have to build a police station to have more police officers? And is that police station going to result in more impacts? So it's kind of a we're looking at the physical impacts. Um, we really get into if I may talk more about this, there's a little bit of a nuance to what a significant impact is yeah. and how we really address that. Yeah. I guess question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Good sorry. Good. Um, I was just saying I thought the transportation point that you just brought was really interesting because it still feels like like urban sprawl still happens, you know, even though they're trying to look at this. So I was kind of just wondering how that kind of works, but I think that was kind of like what you're gonna get into this. Um, a little bit, I think that's a good point. So it kind of goes back to, we provide all the information, we identify potential impacts, we try to mitigate them. Every the agency tries to mitigate them as best as possible. But it's still left up to the decision making body to approve or deny the project. So, even if we find that there's going to be significant impact, something that's really bad related to BMT, it's going to have you know, your average miles or 25 miles each way, you know, tons of GA is going to be released. The lead agency could still say, yeah, we don't care. We want the project more than we don't want the project. We think it's going to be an economic driver. We think it's, this is good for that area. We don't think for all these other reasons. And that, that's at the end of, a, of an EIR. That's something that happens with an EIR specifically. Because we'll have 
It's called a significant and unavoidable. VMT is the issue now, especially in the Central Valley, because as you point out, there are, is, we're used to sprawling. There's a reason why none of us live, you know, right here, right? We all probably live a couple miles away at least, um, or we're from a couple miles away. It, 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 we're spread out, right? Uh, in the Bay Area, in Southern California, where things are a little more compact, it's easier to say, no, we don't have a significant impact on VMT because we don't have to go over here. Are we good to work somewhere close to it or that kind of thing? So when you look at VMT here, there are more significant amount of impacts. And the lead agencies here are trying to address those things. But what it basically means is that now there's more EIRs being prepared than there were four years ago because they can't. They can't make the significant and unavoidable impact related to BMT be less than this is no there's no real way to do it right now. Um, there will be hopefully with the mitigation teams and some other things that are to offset that or reduce the greenhouse gas emissions through other means. Right now they don't have this is we're in the we're in the new new phase of this. It's not a hundred percent phase, it's a try to figure out how to address this issue. So yeah, there's going to be more of that, and, and and because of traditionally the way the Central Valley has developed, probably won't see a lot less sprawl. It will probably be contained by hills, river, and this one not one of the super far. So that's this kind of how it is. <laughs> but yeah, it, that, that one that, this is an extreme example. But BMT is the kind of the reason why now it is the reason why we're seeing more EIRs here because there's no way. And again, to this whole significant versus not significant, those are terms that we that we use in um, in CEQA to identify if you have a significant impact, then you're looking to mitigate that in some way to make it less than significant. And I say less than significant, but that's what we're actually, those are terms of art that we try to address. We're trying to get to. Um, when you have a significant impact, you have a mitigation measure, hopefully that reduces it to a less than significant. If you can't reduce it to less than significant impact, then that is a significant amount of that significant unavoidable impact can only be addressed in the EIR. And if you still have, if it's a significant unavoidable at the end of the EIR, then you have to do it. It's a legal proceeding, but you basically have to identify that it is a, uh, it's going to be significant an overriding consideration. I want to build this development more than I want to reduce the greenhouse gases because you know, we're, we're going to we want this more than we do no project. We'd rather have a project than not the project. And uh, and then there's also no impacts. Uh, right? It's, you know, it's not actually changing the environment, so there's no impact. Make some declarations on that. We'll get to the years we're talking. For example, like in the mineral. Oh, yeah. Okay, so is that kind of similar to like um, in the south where they build in all those wetlands so that they can just keep going through this process over and over and figuring out ways to overwrite it? Um, not necessarily in, in, wetlands, but areas where like the hurricanes have been but always oh, a little water over and over and over if they still keep establishing buildings and stuff there. Well, it's Texas. Yeah, there are a lot of things that we have, yeah. but like is so, that kind of why things like this are just in the process? Because you might always get overwritten in a certain extent if you have a really good one. Kind of. I think that. Um, I mean, I can't speak to every decision that's made for every decision making, but, but speaking so much to that, I mean, there are parts of the Bay Area that um, we've identified that there is going to be sea level rise affecting them. Um, and this kind of, at some point, uh, is the business decision from some people is whether or not to take food for the project. Um, there's, I think, Facebook campuses have basically a problem for them to not have anything in them to accommodate the possible change. Yes. The, the likely sea level rise in that area, they don't have to do. So it kind of depends on, on the project area. CEQA, and I always tell people this, and I've been doing this for way too long, is that CEQA ultimately becomes a business decision in some regard, is how much analysis do you want to have to protect yourself against potential litigation? Or how much do you just want to go out and just do it? Or do you want to? I mean, you can do an ENR for every single project, but that doesn't that doesn't make a lot of financial sense. Um, but if you go in and do very bare minimum, you're opening yourself up to more problems. You know, you're looking at the issues that you want to start. Last day, that's all. So it kind of depends on how the project setup, how savvy the 
developers are, how engaged the, the, the agency is, when you have continued uh, development in areas that are known to be uh, prone to certain things. I mean, the Bay Area is prone to earthquakes and still build. People want to do. I mean, uh, people want to build along the, the Gulf Coast because they like it. Uh, so they have made accommodations. They do have both raised houses along those areas to comfort hurricanes. Um, in California, there's a series of uh, earthquake preventative measures that are required for development. So uh, as long as you meet those requirements, you don't have a significant impact. If you're located in a, a uh, specific earthquake zone, then you have more problems getting financing. So then one way you're not going to have that problem, but you might be able to do things. Uh, Cal State Berkeley, the fault runs directly underneath the state. Um, people still go there routinely to watch games when an earthquake can happen. So, I mean, this is with your risk analysis just, uh, allows you to do it. So, uh, can I ask one more question? Yeah. Well, I, I'm just going to, there's a few, other, I mean, basically, I've been kind of going through it, and then, in fact, this is the last pertinent slide I think I'll show. Oh, uh, so, go ahead. No, I just was wondering about the aesthetics portion, mm -hmm. because, like, I was wondering if that's, like, whenever a apartment complex tries to get built, people's concerns is always that it's just, like, going to make the area just not look as aesthetic or something. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if that's like what they mean, I guess, by that. It, it does. Aesthetics is the most subjective area of this because everyone has their opinion of what's good. Um, the thing about aesthetics in SQL is that it doesn't really matter. You can have a change to the way things look. Um, that's okay. It, it's, it's whether or not there's going to be an adverse effect to the environment on that. And that's really kind of specific when you get into SQL. Most of the aesthetics has to deal with views from or across a project site. So it's mostly like uh, that apartment building is going to block my view of the Sierra, right? So, but it has to be an established view shed and all these other types of things that go into it. When you get into the specific, like, oh, that thing is ugly, that's just an ugly view. That's not really where sequence comes into play. I mean, we may say that this is something that matches the architectural language of that area, but that's not really. You can still have a change, you still have to make it look different under SQL, but that doesn't mean it's a universe. So it, it's a little bit more nuanced and, and it often gets confused with land use when you look, talk about aesthetics because you go, oh, it's a, that's an apartment building. That doesn't look like the single family home next door. It's like, well, that's not really the issue here. So the issue is whether or not it's going to block a view, it's going to change some other type. Uh, also included in that is, Shade sometimes different agencies have shade analysis that are required for the downtown setting. So it kind of it, it varies. So I gave a very long answer to say SQL doesn't really cover that. It covers the, the the change that's going to be occurring, not so much the form that it's going to take. That being said, I've done a project or involved in projects in the Bay Area where there's um, like a big white building in like an area that's mostly tree canopy. And with that, it's like, well, yeah, this is a, it's a glare. Or, or actually, it's not, it's not, it's reflective light. Glare and reflective light, two different things, apparently. Um, I learned that early on in my career. Um, and with that, there is, um, it was going to be a, a, an aesthetic issue because suddenly now you have a reflective light issue. Where there was one. Yeah. So, in, in terms of different types of documents, I, I, I touched on all these things, and you know, there's a whole list of things under EIR. Or you know, or that's because they can take a lot of different forms. Um, but it all kind of gets the same thing where they have a very detailed analysis for the EIS. The mitigated negative declaration and negative declaration need to be supported by an initial area checklist. I might actually go into those too far in, but I have this slide is not part of the presentation. I just have them here in case I can talk about it. And I don't think I have what I want to fit here. I'm going to show a um, they don't have a um, the checklist question, uh, or the, 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 basically, you go through and if you can answer this question, is it going to be a measuring significant impact? The required EIR is going to be less than significant with mitigation, be this is less than significant impact or no. And those are kind of the four different things we look at for negative declaration or mitigation. But the EIR is the same thing and the same question. Um, you just have a more analysis that has to go into it and you open yourself up to think of or there's a potential for that analysis to stop the significant impact. And then you have basically different types of 
addendums to um, EIRs where you use the work that's done before to uh, limit the need to reopen the project or reopen the analysis, but you go through and show that there's no impact. So as I mentioned before, like, there's a lot of different avenues you can take um, for creating a project through on CEQA, and it's all supposed to be a really comprehensive plan uh, when you need to. So that's kind of the and like you get back, there's always going to be that decision that's going to have to be made at some point where you decide, like, well, I don't think I really need to do this really in depth analysis, or a developer doesn't want to pay for a really in depth analysis. They just want to see if they can chance it, which is possible. Some projects get through on things that they shouldn't because the agency doesn't care uh, and they're okay with being able to approve the project with a very small analysis or very, not, not very detailed, like corporate resources analysis. Um, and they're okay, but sometimes those projects get caught up in litigation because they didn't do the analysis. So it's it's a it's a, it's a gray it's a gray field where there's it's very objective in, in one regard, but then it's it's very questionable um, decision making in some regards as well. Uh, but for the most part, the technical aspects of it are pretty simple, and you can go through the implications that uh, by Level of coverage for the decision makers to make a decision and either approve or deny a project. So, I don't really have anything else on here. I can go through and provide a bunch of sorts of questions. Um, so, there's a bunch of different sort of topic areas that we typically cover, um, and those get really detailed really quickly. Um, but yeah, CEQA is a is an ever changing field where the intent is really to get out a lot of these potential impacts and mitigate them. You know, my, my job is really to figure out and provide a document that reduces impacts as much as possible and keeps the environment in the best shape as possible uh, with them, you know, keeping in mind that things with different, different projects have different outcomes and we're trying to make them as best as possible. Say another question. Sorry, I'll let other people this question, but I wanted to know more about that like public uh, comment because I had no idea that that was actually a part of the process. Oh, yeah. um, and like um, you said that everything's available actually as public record. So I was wondering, is there like a specific office that we have to get that kind of information from? Is it the lead agency that took on the project? A little bit of both. Um, it used to be that it was just the lead agency that was responsible for it. In fact, if you live in an area and something is built near your house, more than likely, there was a notice that was probably made available to you that you either didn't see or saw and didn't know what it was or to the okay. If you do like an ER, for example, a public noticing effort is supposed to be done by a lead agency. Most of the time, it's in a newspaper. I don't know how often you read a newspaper, but I don't very often. Um, and that's where most of them are. That being said, if you are part of, of the process or you live nearby, sometimes the noticing, this is different for all the agencies. Sometimes noticing is anybody within 500 feet of a developer gets a notice. Um, sometimes it's um, they have a really big for I did the general plan for the city of Fresno. In that process, there was a required outreach outreach program, and we did more noticing for for specific plans, which are larger areas for not the whole city, but the, the subset of the city. There's a, usually a extensive outreach program associated. With the specific plan that kind of feeds into that. So you get more people involved in that. But if you, but for a lot of development, especially in the Central Valley, this happens more in Central Valley because there aren't as many um, projects that are as controversial, honestly. And that more, that's kind of a cultural thing. That's kind of just how it had been traditionally. But in the Bay Area, where I spent a good chunk of my career, most things can be controversial pretty quickly. And with that, you have a different expectation for noticing it. So for an EIR, we have most noticing required. At the beginning of an EIR process, you're supposed to, if you are required to issue a notice of preparation to tell the world that you're preparing an EIR. And that goes out to lots of different people. The noticing list is pretty small at that point because no one really knows about the project, but it's advertised in the newspaper and it's other venues to the agency. And at that point, you can go and talk or you can provide comments to the agency and say, I think that you should look at this resource up here. And I think you should. I know that there are some birds that live on that side that are in danger. You should really make sure you look at that. And then that's the first step. But then after they go through the process of preparing the EIR, there's a 45 day review period where anyone who commented before 
will get noticed and they have an opportunity to review the analysis. But no analysis is done in the beginning. You can go and tell them, I want this analysis done. It hasn't been done yet. So they have to go do that after the meeting. And then you go and talk and provide the comments on that. So it's, it's supposed to be very um, outwardly focused. Um, meeting the requirements is one that is different than a full noticing program. Um, and it really depends on the agency and how they approach their sales. So, and it's really interesting. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, you mentioned how, like, anyone who like made a notice about the um, review, they can look over, right? Like any, anyone who, yeah, so notice, so anybody who makes a comment on any part of the process, like, hey, are you comments on it, or yeah, you would, if they, they look over and they have something they want to like talk about, can they like, well, I haven't like, they have about it or like something? Yes, absolutely. So, and then also when you when you provide comments, anything that you provide as part of the process, it becomes public record. So if you send an email in during the NOP, the notice of preparation period, you say, I really think you should look at Peregrine Falcons because they're going to be stuck outside of this building here, and that's going to be affected by this development here. Um, your record, your comments would be in the record. It's going to follow through on that set of projects as it goes through. And anyone as part of the public disclosure process, that, that EIR, for example, is going to be something that is publicly available. You can go and talk to the planning agency who is responsible for that, that lead agency and get comments of them, get all the comments. Yeah. I was kind of like wondering because, like, you know, in our university, the EIR is for whenever they want to build something new. Like, I, I've never heard of being able to give comment on this. Oh, you can. Yeah. And so it's like interesting to me to know that. You know, we, we have people who live on campus here, right? And have you ever been told that you can give comment on stuff like that? <laughs> so that's interesting. Well, I mean, yeah. So and another example in, in, in the city of Berkeley and, and Cal, they don't get along at all. They don't like each other. Um, and even though kind of one feeds the other and vice versa, because you have so many college students who live in the city and City is basically there's all sorts of college uh, facilities within the city itself, and they routinely go back and forth on. But mostly, it's the city commenting on the state. But the state is required to do any number of different analyses uh, for CEQA. I mean, they have home range plans that are applicable to this school, and then anything that's developed. I mean, it's, there's probably less environmental reviews for the new buildings because it was probably covered under a previous document. So, some of them. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. My part of the sequence is not to reinvent the wheel for every new project if it's similar or a part of it. So if you have a long-range plan for the university and you're looking to you know, add several buildings, the point is not to go and say, oh, yeah, we have this long-range plan. These are all the buildings we want to do and you know, do an analysis on that. It's not intended for you to go and do another environmental review when you go and build it or when you actually have the designs and you're ready to do it. You want to go and take whatever was done beforehand and lean on them as much as you can to say, yeah, the impacts are the same, or no, they're different. Here, here's what the impacts and how they differ. Here are the mitigation factors to cover. It's not to start the process over again. It's to make a one comprehensive analysis, um, or at least an attempt to do that. So to, to, I can't speak to the buildings that were you know, added to the campus, but my guess is that there was probably the, the long range plan that done, they probably were covered in some regard to that. And then there's probably smaller documents that came through after that, like an initial study that was teetered off of that other document, like larger EIR that you can use to look studies and come Yeah, no, that's more or less the same. But here's the differences. So there probably was that attempt, or there's an exemption to it because this is actually the addition to this particular building. I've done a lot of educational facilities in my years, and with that, I mean, there's it's a different set of issues because it's usually an extension or modification of an existing school. So you don't have the same impacts you would if it was a greenfield development. If you're going to go out and build something on the ag fields out here, different team. I mean, you're looking at some other your impacts, but if you're going to do something that's here, you're not going to have the same biological resource issues, cultural resources, minerals, all those types of things. So there's different degrees of opposition that can come out of projects based on that. Yes. I just thought here, so I don't know if you already touched on this, but um, if there's like an existing structure and you're trying to build new construction, do you guys kind of 
might take into consideration the previous two I'm sure it has like historic value or if they can qualify for historic registration or yeah, you have to talk about that. Yeah. So cultural resources and uh, the built environment are a major component of security. Um, it's one of the major resource topic areas that we have technical experts that we have that specifically address that. Uh, there's the eligibility issue, and there's also whether or not it is. If it is, that becomes an issue with the very mitigate. If it's eligible, then it's a whole other issue. Well, and you have to kind of grade whether or not the eligibility would be affected by the project. So, I mean, if you're, if you have it, I mean, if you have a, an old building on a large parcel, like an old farmhouse, right? And it's really old and it's, it's nice, it looks pretty and everything, but the question is whether or not to preserve that or if it's going to be an impact when you get rid of it. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. Decide whether or not experts, if it's eligible for it. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. One of the things that associate with somebody famous is it an architectural example that's you know, famous for this particular area. Um, and if all those things are not the case, then you know it is what it is, and you can demolish it. Um, sometimes the mitigation is to move it and actually pick up the building. And make. So there's all different considerations. But yes, historical resources, the built environment, is very much a sequence. Okay. Um, so we're going to go ahead for me, honestly, it's interesting. If I can, I tell people this all the time, um, I can drive around and kind of get a sense of how things operate by, I think I was talking with Dustin. Dustin is an intern in our office. Um, and, and so I just, when I moved here from the Bay Area, I didn't know what all these big, uh, looking like lakes out in the middle of like Fresno Clubs. There's all these big retention ponds. Like, what is this? Because in the Bay Area, we have rivers and creeks and all the water goes through them and out to the bay. That's kind of how it works. Here, because it's flat and there's only a few rivers and they're far apart, there's no real easy way for the water to go. So then I kind of looked into why that works and how it works and all the impacts related to it. So then, so having that understanding, you get a better sense of like, well, if I am you know, doing something in my front yard, this water is going to go that makes more bad. So you get a better sense of how. To me, that's interesting because now I can understand, like, well, I know that this freeway is not going to get built anytime soon because there's all sorts of things that happen. Terms of so I'm kind of curious, like with uh, the sustainable groundwater ready and you know, like is there crossover between sequel and that? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So water, so wildfire, water, and ANT traffic are the kind of big issues here, especially in water. Um sigma is what we call it, um, is is huge because you can't really guarantee water. I mean, there's contracts for you know, what's supposed to be available to the to um, purveyors and providers of water, um, but it's very difficult to look at that. What's interesting that I've seen in CEQA related to Sigma is that agricultural resources, um, for like if you really look at it and we're bad, like a versus a house, one house is a fraction of what the tree does in terms of water. Like, the amount of water that I'm using to relative to a house is so different that in, I've seen the case where adding in all these houses is better for the environment than having all these streets because the water is seized. That's a real argument. It, it is, and it's legitimate. It's whether or not you know, an agency wants to do that. There are important ag lands we do need to have. But outside of that, there are some real limitations. There are sections of the valley that you that they have taken out of agricultural production because there is enough water and it makes more sense to preserve this flood control and biological resources and conservation. So, part of it is to preserve other and when you take it to the island. Do you get yeah. more about Sigma? I know enough to like, review it. Like, I know that it's like super new. So there are a lot of people that are trying to get into it. Never seen like, somebody who just specializes in that. How do you specialize in something like that? You work for like a consulting firm, you know, see what is you learn about it or uh, a little bit. Yeah. Where it really crosses over into sequel is figuring out about water supply analysis, is what WSA is When you get into WSA, which is another acronym, um, it's something that you're gonna build a 
part, like a housing development, you need to be able to show, or a large scale development, you need to be able to show that there is enough water to supply. It's tricky because when you look at what it's actually available, though it's a state can provide, what a utility can provide, there's different contracts and different long term pumping rates and all these types of things you have to look at. So, SIGMA is really about balance pool. It's about not using too much water relative to the land use to be able to have enough to recharge the system and, and use it for. There's a lot that goes into water because, like all those, those ground bases we talked about, those retention bases, that eventually goes into the water supply. And when you move water around and you let it filtrate into the system and then you pump it back out, it's the soil is cleaning out your water, you're doing all these other things. So the, the idea is really to balance as much as possible because we don't know if we're going to have a bunch of dry years now. So it's both the engineering use. Hydrologists, geomorphologists, all the type of people kind of go into the engineering field. They deal a lot with sigma. sigma. So when I look at large scale projects, I and a WSA is required, I usually look to the engineers that I know and ask for them to, to do an analysis for that. So you provide that documentation for to the engineers to identify that. Or did I say this now? So I don't want to keep people in here, but thank you so much for the presentation. It was very informative, and I I feel like I actually learned a lot. And I feel like I knew a lot about CQO already. <laughs> so, and thank you, everybody. Feel free to stay here if you want to keep asking questions, but you're free to go if you want it. Thank you. Thank you.